Hi folks, uh, I'm Jack Kennedy and welcome to our special winter feed webinar for Dairy Link Ireland. Um, delighted to be joined by experts in their field and a host farmer as well. Uh, our host farmer and host farm, I suppose, because it's a family farm situation is, is Stephen Wallace, Stephen and Hazel Wallace farming in Seaford County Down. We're joined also by Aidan Cushnahan, our Dairy Link advisor, um, seconded to the Dairy Link program. Um, also joining us is Lyle Hamilton from Farmgate Nutrition, a nutritionist to the Wallace Farm. Later in the programme, we'll be joined by Alan Hops, a senior dairy advisor with, with DIRA, as well to talk about margin over concentrate and what it actually means. Um, folks, I, I suppose to kick off this webinar, I suppose it, I think it's, it's, it's important, I suppose, just to kind of give an, an idea of what we're going to discuss. I mean, the, the, the issues that we want to, it's, it's early January, so it's early January 2021, the start of a, of, a, of a new year. But I suppose we're still in the depths of winter and winter feed is, the, is a crucial, crucial aspect of making, making profit, making, making money at this time of the year for, for, for farmers that are producing milk during the winter. So I, we want to, I suppose, have a look at effective feed management, what happens on, on farms across Northern Ireland and what's happening on the Wallace farm. We're going to do a, have a bit of a chat around, I suppose, a fodder audit in terms of what happened to this farm late last year, this year to kind of put the feed in place. We're going to talk a bit about winter diets, what exactly is is the situation on, on this farm, what's happening. Um, and I suppose a little piece around kind of monitoring performance in terms of, you know, how do we measure that this and we're, we're up to scratch or we're, we need to do some changes or whatever on the farm. So, I mean, Stephen, to, to, to kick us off, I mean, to give us a kind of a feel for your farm and and and, and what's happening, says you, um, maybe just give us a few, a few kind of one-liners or a couple of thoughts on, on kind of the farm that yourself and Hazel are managing and, and, and you know, what's, what's happening on the farm at the moment. Give us a little bit of a rundown. Well, <clears throat> a wee bit of an introduction to the farm. As the slide shows, we're in Seaford. Uh, we would have a, a free draining ground, quite stony, but uh, we were have a good position for grazing access to our grazing paddocks. Our grazing is all around the yard and uh, our farm is located in the middle of our of, of all of our ground so uh, access to ground is to grazing ground is good we have fair laneways um what we have changes that we've been doing over this past uh three four years we've been plate measuring our grass um trying to utilize forage from uh, milk from forage better and uh, we've changed the herd from all year grazing sorry, all year calving to mm. autumn. Okay. The reasons we've went for autumn calving, um, as I say, we've good access to our ground. Potentially, we can get our cows turned out if the weather allows it early in the spring, that them being in calve. Um, so we've been doing that and uh, we're on, we're, we're currently, I suppose we have maybe this year we have 150 calved and uh, maybe we have 50, 50 more to calve and um, that should be finished by near to the end of February. Okay, um, so so Stephen, it's, it's fair to say, that, I mean, that, that piece will say to go to autumn calving, it's a kind of a work in progress. As you say, you started breeding the 1st of December 2020, we'll say, and you still had a number of cows to calve. So... I, I, I'll say you're kind of, you're, you're not 100% autumn calving just yet, you know, or, or maybe it's it's a little bit spread out just yet. Is, 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 is that fair to say, Stephen, just in terms That's of... That's fair to yeah. say, Jack, it's work on going. Hopefully, now the bulling has went well uh, from this December, so we're on this for about another change that we have done, which is in helping us with went to uh, RMS, uh, to help with a technician daily coming in to jock and serve and um, find that as a as a, a a good help and yes it's ongoing we're not just this is really our second year full on to RMS and uh, it, I find it it frees my time up considerably and I find it a good a good help but yes uh, we're not there yet by any means Jack. 
Okay, and I mean, and that'll obviously influence some of the kind of measurements we'll see from your farm, kind of, I suppose, later on in the in the, in the webinar. But but yeah, so I mean, from what I hear you, Stephen, in terms of, and I've been on the farm, obviously, like so. It's a, it's I call it, it's it's a very dry farm, you know, you know, and obviously you're in you're in County Down, you're not quite Port of Ferry, but like I mean, you're you're just below Down Patrick, and you're 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 not far from you're to the right of Banbridge, you know, for for viewers that will say just to put you in put you in a location, you know, but it's it's a good part of the world to grow grass to produce feed winter feed etc but I mean potentially like you can get you can get I call it you can get quite dry during the kind of main grazing season you know during June and July yeah yes that uh, had a big impact on us in 2020 and um, two three years ago as well we would burn up a lot um, for instance this year we had uh, we're doing the plate measuring and Aidan may refer to it later but uh, instead of in May, we were down till 18 kilograms of growth uh, yeah. of dry matter per day, like so, uh, yeah. sorry, 16 and it was. Yeah, so it's, it's, yeah. it's only 20% of what it should be really in May is what you're saying, really, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also a benefit to Jack were as uh, swaying as to go for the autumn cabin is going to be the winter bonus, which is a big advantage uh, as a, it's a time to maximize on milk prices as well. So it is. So that's also a financial okay. benefit. So. Okay. So I hear you. So you're saying that the bonus that's there from your your Lakeland supplier, obviously. So that the bonus that's there from Lakeland is an incentive. You you need to try and maximise that. Then if you're going to produce during the winter, you need to try and get that bonus, or else it's not worthwhile at all, or you're not getting no benefit for the extra cost that's there during the winter. And my own view would be on uh, consolidation of Cavan. It will help your uh, margin over concentrate rather than cows can get lost into this invisible mm. all year round cavern so it does focus it does focus the mind on uh, a tighter cavern pattern yeah yeah you're right and it, it again it'll, it's something we might touch off later on in terms of how you manage the different groups and i'm sure yourself and lyle are working on that you know all the time in terms of targeting the feed at the right animals at the right stage of lactation etc and that kind of you're dead right i think i think that that compression of of calving is has a lot to do with it um steven we'll, we'll leave it at that we've got a good feel for, for where you for where the farm is and we, we get more as, as 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 we go through the presentation um i mean aiden to, to bring you in on it just in terms of what steven talked about there and the dryness of this particular farm i mean Talk to us about kind of some of the, some of the work you did in 2020 in terms of June and July and trying to, you know, see what feed that this farm had to produce milk during the winter that we're currently in. Yep, thanks for that, Jack. Yes, and hello there, everybody. Uh, yes, fodder audits are something that are carried out on each project farm within the Dairy Link uh, project. But the fodder audit I seen particular importance in the case of Stephen and Hazel because, as Stephen has already alluded to, in May and June, we experienced some very warm, dry conditions not had a negative impact on grass growth in the farm. Over a three to four week period, there were growth rates being recorded on a weekly basis in the region of 20 to 40 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day, which as you've already highlighted is well below what we'd expect for the time of year. So in July, we took a conscious decision to carry out an audit for the farm to see how much uh, fodder had we available to feed all stock in the farm for a six month period, if that was required. And at that stage, it looked like we could be identifying a potential deficit approaching 190 uh, tons of silage if things had panned out a certain way. So we decided to take action to redress that. And you can see some of the things that took place that are all on the slide there. Stephen went out and purchased some silage off a neighboring farm, uh, which is being fed to the heifer replacements at the minute. Uh, the fact that Stephen was measuring grass on a weekly basis allowed us to make some extra decisions in that we could allocate extra land for later cuts on the farm and take out uh, excess covers on the grazing platform as well, which are put in the bale silage and added to stocks of silage. And as it happened, the grass growth rates also increased on the farm in July and August, above what we'd normally expect for the time of year. So that in itself helped to increase the amount of silage that was available on the farm. So I think in the next slide, Jack, you can, you can see some of the silage actually being lifted on the farm. I, you can remember, Stephen, that, that was silage that was lifted off some of the grazing platform, isn't that right? Yes, yes, it yep. was. It was. That's, that's what I thought, yep. So uh, giving an example, just some of the grass that was being lifted. We then carried out the audit exercise again about three to four weeks ago in December. Uh, and you can see some of those figures in a bit more detail at this stage. The top three lines refer to silage stocks on the farm, be it clump silage or big field silage, 
and the lines below that refer to the amount of silage we reckon we're needed to feed all stock on the farm for a four month feed in period. You can see there roughly we estimated there were around 1300 tons of clamp silage on the farm of which about 500 tonne was made of first cut silage. Uh, another 200 tonnes of big bale silage add into a total amount in the farm around 1,500 tonnes of silage. And for so, a four and, and, period, and, and, period yep. so, Sorry, Aidan. I mean, so, I mean, that 500 tonnes, as you say, yep. you have 1,300 of clamp silage and 500 yep. of first cut. I mean, that's back a lot. I, is, is that back a lot from where kind of it should be? Like that, that 500 of the 1,300, 500 was first cut. I mean, should first cut be a bigger proportion of that clamp silage of that 1,300 piece? I think it's fair to say, Jack, what, what, what the original plan would have been for a bigger proportion of that uh, clamp silage to be first cut silage. And yeah. it, it's reflected how the approach and the approach that Lyle and Stephen have taken and formulating at that for the, the cows this winter as well. Uh, but it's just it's it's just largely a reflection of the conditions that were experienced at the time. Um, okay. A lot of farms in that part of the country were, were had, had, had silage yields which were below target and um, I've had to take steps to redress that balance in some shape or form. Okay, no, that's fine. So go, keep going then, as you said, to the, into the requirements. Like, yeah. Yes, well, as I, as I just briefly referred to, the, the lines you can see there uh, below the, the fodder stocks refer to what we estimated to be requirements for different classes of livestock on the farm for a four month feeding period. And we estimated that around, we'd need around 1300 tons of silage uh, for that four month feeding period uh, if the animals have to be kept in that length of time. So we've gone from a situation where potentially we could have been looking at a deficit of 190 tonnes of silage back in July to a situation where we now think uh, we have an, a surplus uh, stock there of around 180 tonnes instead through the actions which were taken by Stephen in, okay. in 2020. Uh, okay, it's well, it's better, to, better, to be look, it's better to be looking at it than looking for it anyway, says you, especially on a farm where you have that amount of animals and where you're producing a lot of milk during the winter period. Absolutely, Jack. I suppose it's also worth bearing in mind that when this exercise was carried out in December, a four-month period, feeding period could potentially mean that turnout mightn't be until mid to late April. Uh, Stephen's already highlighted that this is a dry farm he's managing, so uh, we're looking for opportunities there to get cows out earlier not, and certainly if the situation arises that the cows can go out that bit earlier, we'll be looking at that actively, and that in itself should help to reduce any potential deficiencies that exist as well. Okay, Jack, could I interlude there? Yeah, you're 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 correcting about the the acreage and the tonnage of the first being uh, well below par, and uh, due to the plate measuring, what happened there also was uh, we're finding ourselves with the plate measuring. You're able to read that there's not enough grazing ahead for the milkers, so we're having to poach bale uh, poach fields out of silage. And that reduced as well as the dryness also uh, that also cut down acreage and tonnage. So I hear, was, I, uh, I hear you. Nice. Yeah, you were conscious that you were short and that you had to make that little bit more silage, etc. And and that was putting you putting you putting the squeeze on. Like yeah. Well, yes, it was. We're, we're, we're having to take silage fields out for grazing, so that was uh, yeah. That okay. Also cut the cut the. Yeah. And but just to stay with that for one moment, and we move on then to the silage analysis piece. I mean, I mean, did you feel that the, the weekly measurement of, of grass on the farm did that help keep the focus at that time of the year and, and, and a focus on both the grass for the cow and I suppose the winter feed side of things? Like, very much, very much, Jack. Um, did you were able to see what was coming up ahead? Mm. You're, you're seeing your shortfalls, or in some latter, we're seeing surplus and that was useful for to be able to set fields off and uh, use them for maybe round baling or bring them in for for, for cutting okay so okay yes the plate measuring does keep you well on top of grass control yeah um okay um i think jack from what i remember the exercise it gave steve and i both confidence there to say yes we can definitely take this this area out mm. percentage where if we hadn't been measuring that grass We've probably been more hesitant about not having enough grass to graze the cows, and not and, mm. and end up maybe just dealing with having too much grass to graze and not have the side agent instead. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, okay, no, I, I mean it's a good, it's a great lesson, as you say, for, for for the year that was in it. Um, move on in terms of the silage analysis, and I'll bring in Lyle. Just you go through it first, Aidan, maybe just in terms of the dry cow silage, the first cut silage, and the deferred cut silage, and the replacement heifer silage that you have up on the screen here. Yeah. 
Certainly. Uh, well, look, you're just you're looking at a selection of silages that are available for feeding on the farm at this moment in time. And the silage quality is monitored on a regular basis to assess the nutritive value of the forages available to the livestock. Uh, and what you can see here are samples taken from the dry cow silage, the first cut silage, the third cut silage, and the silage being fed to the heifer replacements. Uh, and we've tried to summarize those into the main values, be it dry matter, the D value, crude protein, and energy or MB uh, values, and the intake value. And we've also uh, uh, measured the cation anion balance in the dry cow silage. Um, I'm sure like, you maybe have to comment to make here as well, but I, the larger effect the conditions that the, the, the silage is remained under. If you look at the first cut silage, that, that silage was made in the first week in May, warm, dry conditions, uh, good leafy grass, and it's reflected in a high dry matter, high energy uh, silage with good intake characteristics. Uh, third cut silage, cut towards the end of August, or early September, in somewhat inclement conditions, and um, dry matter and energy content would reflect that as well. But Again, largely reflective of what else was going on around the country at that time. Um, the dry cow silage has been purposely made for dry cows, and that Stephen uh, made the silage without a plan any slurry and reduced uh, potash applications in an effort to reduce that cation anion balance. So, he's, what he's trying to do with that forage there is minimize the risk of milk fever of those cows once they calve down. Okay, so I mean that gives us a good snapshot. I'll bring in Lyle next now, but that, I mean that gives a good snapshot of of the kind of the silage, the analysis. And again, not every farm has analysis, but I mean, if I was to summarize in one line, the first cut is is good quality, but any the rest of the stuff, I I call it it's it's fairly average, isn't it? In terms of and and it's a res, as a result of the season and as a result of what happened on this particular farm, etc., uh, because of the weather and, and that kind of thing as well. I mean. Lyle, I mean, is that a fair comment to say that, you know, you, you have a decent first cut and you have average enough, you know, other silages on this farm now? Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I think it is, Jack. Um, I mean, I mean, as, as Aidan said there earlier, <clears throat> I think uh, the first cut silage and the third cut silage are both very typical of, of Northern Ireland this year. Um, the, the first cut's excellent and the third cut, as you say, is just, just average. Um, <clears throat> I would imagine the second cut silage will be better analysis than the third, but it'll probably still be in around that sort of 10.5 ME and maybe a, a D value of 66 sort of thing. Um, and and it, it, to be honest, it just shows the impact of of last summer's sort of dry conditions because it's, it's going to impact on our milk from forage figures, not only last summer because we were feeding silage instead of fresh grass, yeah. um, but it's, it also affects us during the winter now because we're not getting the milk from forage that we would have got. If we're able to feed, if we're able to feed the milking cows all first cut silage, we'll be taking an extra two liters from forage per cow per day. Whereas, whereas we're not doing that because we're having to mix the two silages together to, just to make the first cut last right, right through the season. Okay, and sorry, I mean you, you point out, I mean the second the analysis for the second cut silage is not on this slide. I mean people will be wondering, I suppose, why it's not there. It's 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 buried under the third cut, I think, isn't isn't that the case? It, it is, yeah. So basically, the, the second cut was put in at the back of the pit, and then the third cut was put in in front and over the top. So okay. we're, we're physically not able to get a not not okay. easily anyway get get a sample of the second cut. So. Okay, it's, we're not trying to hide the results or anything. Like, no, um, <laughs> no. It, it, it is no. what it is. Like, yeah, no, that's it fair is, enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, like, uh, like with, with this information. Uh, I mean, in terms of trying to create a, a kind of a, a dry cow diet and, and, and a milky cow diet, I mean, what, what were some of the kind of things that you were kind of yourself and Stephen and Aidan were discussing, I suppose, as, as you kind of tried to formulate a plan for the current winter? Yeah, well, whenever, whenever we're formulating the plan, as you say, I mean, I suppose that the first thing we do, right, what, what, are, what are our targets, you know, for, for the winter? First of all, you know, we're, we're, we're I mean, in terms of dry cows, we're, we're targeting a body condition score of in around three. Um, we're, we're hitting an average of an eight week dry period. And basically we've, we've specifically made dry cow silage for those cows to, to reduce metabolic disorders after calving. Um, and, and basically to, to, to basically from a labor point of view, we want to try and save as much labor in the yard as possible. So basically these cows are fed ad lib uh, round bale silage. This dry cow silage has been made in, in, in round bales. Um, and it's fed ad lib to those cows. And then for the, for the four week period before calving, they're fed two kilos of a, of a, of a dry cow nut that, that's been made up, you know, it's been made up in terms of balance and protein and energy levels there. Um, and then for the milking cows, basically we're saying, right, uh, we're going to have mostly fresh calf cows. We want to target, you know, target good milk yields, but the, the key things for fertility. Um, and basically, but you can see that the milking cow diet there in particular, we're feeding a, a mixture of first and third cut silage. Again, that's just to stretch out the first cut. And um, we realized at the start of the winter, whenever we did our, our audit, um, 
we realised if I'd have fed first cut only, we would have run out of it probably by now already. We would have been run out of first cut, and the cows would have been moving on to nine point eight me third cut silage, and and it would have been a disaster for fertility to be honest. Um, so we're, we're trying to get consistency the whole way through the, the breeding period, basically, that the cows aren't, or there's no dramatic changes in diet or anything they got there, um, just to, just to keep them steady. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. So what I'm looking at that slide and I see, okay, the dry cow diet is, is the first column and I'm seeing 36 kilos of, of uh, more or less, as you say, ad lib round bale silage that's going in. It's, it's relatively, I call it average quality. And then the yep. pre-caver blend going in as, as well each day. So each, each cow is getting two kilos of, 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 of that blend for the, for, for, is that for the full six that- or eight weeks? No, no, that, that that's only for th- it'll be between three and four weeks before calving. So okay. for the first for the first four weeks of the dry cow period, they're only they're only those cows are only getting silage, and then for the for the last three to four weeks, they're getting two kilos of the of the dry cow blend on top. That's basically we're we're trying to we're trying to basically we're we're trying to increase the energy level a wee bit in that last that last last three or four weeks, yeah. um, increase the protein level of the diet slightly, yeah. so those cows are getting probably closer to fourteen percent crude protein in the diet. Um, and that's just in, ter- in terms of colostrum production, in terms of milk right. production, and from again from a fertility point of view, um, the eggs, the eggs that Stephen's trying to, you know, the, 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 the RMS technicians trying to get served now or fertilised today, those eggs were being produced during that last three or four weeks of, of the dry period. So in terms of the egg quality that uh, that, that we're trying to fertilise today, that that's an important period of time in there. Okay. as well so that's why we're trying to increase energy levels <laughs> during that period as well okay so as you say it, it's not all about trying to kind of up the condition score in those dry cows in the last no. couple of weeks there's more there's a lot of other bits and pieces going on in the background as you say that yeah. you need to yeah. you need to feed moving into the milk and cow diet i mean again i'm looking at the slide and i see 19 mm-hmm. kilos of first cut 19 kilos of third cut and then you have seven seven kilos of a blend again going into that tmr uh, yep. ration we'll say and then and after that, then it's it's according to milk yield. There's like there's also parlor uh, concentrate in the parlor. So I mean, yeah. I think you know maybe Stephen is probably up around eleven or twelve kilos in total now of blend. We'll say going into cows at this time of the year. Is that correct? Uh, yep, yep, that, that'll be correct. Basically, the, the cows today are, are sitting at about a thirty-four liter average. Um, so they are. So we're always trying to strike that balance between between feed efficiency and and also given given the high yielding cows a chance. You know the, the fresh cows in this herd. Are averaging just over forty liters today, um, so they are the cows that are that are calved this season. Um, if you separate them out, so you know if we feed any less than twenty three liters in the wagon, we're we're not going to feed those cows enough for the milk they're they're producing. So, um, so we're feeding for twenty three liters in the wagon again. If, if we we're feeding all first cut silage, we'd be getting twenty three liters from maybe five 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 and a half kilos of concentrate instead of seven. Um, so again, that, that that's that that would improve our milk from forage today. But you know we're we're sitting today at in around seven or eight liters per cow from forage, so um, we're we're happy enough for that during the winter months. And uh, I say we're feeding the yield then above above the twenty three liters then. Okay, and we'll come back to get that again maybe on the next slide. I mean, just to finish off on the diets, the the heifer replacements then they're on eighteen kilos of that, of that I call it dry, the dry cow, the average quality dry cow silage, and they're also on three and a half kilos of of a blend in 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 a, in, a, in a ration in a mix like. Yeah. Yep, and then for yep, so those heifers were, were basically we're, we're trying to target that sort of 0.8 of a kilo a day live weight gain. Calvin, those heifers down no older than 24 months of age. Um, and probably fair to say something you know, in the past, Stephen, we've probably struggled, we've probably struggled to get growth rates right with, with heifers. And what we've found is rightly or wrongly, if, if we keep that concentrate level up a bit during the winter months, and we are feeding again average silage to these heifers, we're feeding 10 ME silage. So um, I'll have to keep the concentrate levels up, and, and so far so good. Certainly, according to the RMS technician, like I think we've we've bred forty somewhere between forty and fifty heifers so far, um, and and those heifers, you know, they show that the heat, the heat detection is good, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, a lot of those heifers are in calf um, already. And then once once they're in calf, and, and especially when they go out to grass, we'll pull that we'll pull that feed rate well back then. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's before we go on to the kind of Indian parlor piece. I mean, it's it, it's fair to say that, I mean, your your objective is not to make as much poor quality or average quality silage. You know, I mean, you're you're because of oh, yeah. the, the, both the heifers and the milking cows and the, producing so much milk during the winter. I mean, the quality. The, you, your aim, if you could, and you had a, had everything going for you, is to make better quality forage. Isn't that isn't that that goes without saying? 
Yeah, well, very much so. I mean, definitely. I mean, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, the last number of years, that's where we're tar- the target on the farm is is three is three top quality cuts of silage if we can. Um, but as I say, this year and and it, and it is typical of of the vast majority of farms in Northern Ireland this year. Uh, f- first cuts are excellent, and second, third, and fourth cuts, if, if guys are taking four cuts, um, are 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 average or poor. So they are just a bit of the weather, you know, in inclement weather the whole way from from the middle of June really. Um, uh, and just it, it made made conditions difficult the rest of the year after after the dry period. Okay, we'll move on. I mean, this next slide, um, I suppose, mm. Lyle goes through. I suppose the the plan for the the in parlour f- piece in terms of where how it gets up and 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 how it comes back off. We'll say once they go over a certain days in milk. Yeah, yeah. Well, basically, the, the, the target for the, for the first sort of twenty eight days in milk, we're not basically that that's a dairy master feeding program. So. Um, it's it, it, it's all works through auto ID. Um, the plan for the first 28 days is for the computer just to ignore the milk yield of the cow and just build her up gradually. So for that first 21 days, the, the plan is to try and maximize forage intake. And um, so we don't want to give too much concentrates to the cows in the first three weeks to encourage her appetite, to encourage her to go forward to the feed barrier and eat, 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 eat more forage. Um, but on the other hand, we don't want to feed her too little either. Because uh, on this yard, we we'll have well, we do have quite a lot of high yielding, uh, you know, uh, Holstein dairy cows that, that will produce milk no matter how much meal we feed them. And um, so we we'll have to we we'll have to get enough energy, make sure we get enough energy into those cows to, to sustain their milk production. Um, so during this period, we're we're building them up at, at roughly 0.3 of a kilo a day, um, and then after day 28, that they're they're moving on to feed the yield a proper feed the yield system. Um, Main difference being from day 37, as you can see, till day 100, uh, we're basically feeding for a minimum of 35 litres of milk. Uh, reason being, just in case a cow in that period of time maybe maybe takes a case of mastitis or, or has a problem, um, it, it means that a feed yield system is very, very good when a cow is milking well. But if a, cow, if a cow's milk yield starts to drop dramatically, well, then the feed starts to, to drop dramatically as well. Um, so we're putting in like a safety net basically for those fresh calf cows that they won't drop any less. I mean, the, the potential of those cows is easily 35 litres. So um, so that, that, that's what we're doing for the first 100 days, Jack. Okay. Uh, again, from a from a fertility point of view, our aim is to, is to have those cows served at least twice by that stage and, and you know, over 50% of the herd back in calf PD positive by day 100. Um, yeah. uh, so we're again, we're, we're trying not to have any, any, any negative effects on cows in terms of fertility. Um, and then after day 100, that safety net basically disappears and, and we're feeding for 23 litres and, and we're, f- we're feeding at 0.45 of a kilo per litre above that and then but, 0.4 of a kilo per litre after day 200 just mm-hmm. for the steeler cash. So that's, it, we're at, at the moment, the, the, the Wallace herd, I call it, is kind of give or take between those two events, five and six, is between kind of 110 days in milk, we'll say. So some of the, yeah. it just in, in, in the next week or so, the, the the flat rate you know for for the flat rate five kilos for the 35 liters will will come off and you'll feed for 23 uh, liters and and 0.45 of a kilo concentrate per per liter of milk above that that's that's what will be set at yeah 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 now it's probably it's probably important to say maybe and, and that's uh, i mean that that 5.4 kilos before day 100 that, that's a minimum so there is there will be cows in there if they're given 50 liters of milk they'll be getting 10 kilos of concentrate yeah, so they will. Yeah. So they they'll be fed the yield above that thirty five. But yes, yeah. after after day one hundred eighteen, then they're they're down and, to the proper feed the yield. And, and Lyle, would you have any concerns in terms of that ten kilos of concentration? That, that's obviously then five kilos in the morning, five kilos in the evening. That's a, like that's yeah. a lot. That's a lot of feed for for it, for a one yeah. for a one feed occurrence. Like yeah, it is. And and, and to be honest, yes. I mean, I, 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 I probably always have concerns about that level of feed through the parlor. Um, but I suppose again that that's it, it, we're trying to strike the balance of. I mean, but I guess I'm happy reducing that concentrate level in the parlour to, to a maximum of eight kilos per day, but mm. but I would have to increase the, the the amount of blend going through the wagon then to do that, and then that's where maybe our feed rate per litre starts to increase a bit too much because there's cows in there not justifying more 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 kilos of meal in the wagon, and um, so again we're always just trying to strike that balance of of feeding enough in the wagon. But not feeding too much that we're overfeeding stale cows, or, or you know, because there is still some stale cows in, in the herd currently, um, yeah. but not not too many. But um, it's always just trying to strike that balance. Ten, I, but I guess I never like to go above ten per day because five, five kilos each milking is a lot. A lot. Um, but so far, 
and certainly in, in, in past experience and Stephen Jard have been doing that for a number of years and, and it, it doesn't seem to cause us any issues we, we formulate the, the powder not specifically knowing that we're going to be feeding that level um, so we're, we're, we have plenty of soya hulls, sugar beet nuts in there uh, from a fibre point of view and we've acid buff and yeast in there as well just to, to make sure we're, we're, buffering, we're buffering the rumen um, as, as well as we can Stephen, have you noticed any any cows off farm in terms of feeding? We'll say this year has there has there been anything noticeable? Like, I mean, obviously you're going to get individual occurrences of various bits and pieces, but I mean, anything of note in terms of feeding problems? We'll say nutritionally associated with cows this winter so far. Uh, Jack, no, I haven't. Uh, I'm quite pleased with her with her uh, dry cow silage because. Uh, the milk fever is working well for, I th I've had two cows that I have put bottles in uh, coming after calving and they weren't downers, but they were, were a bit staggery. And other than that there, the cows have, um, uh, I'm happy with them. And this year even is, there's very few cud balls. So, so it's pretty well, going pretty well. So it is. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think the, the, the key thing as well in terms of that 10 kilos a meal, um, you know, we're, we're actually we're, we're not we're not we're not letting cows go up to 10 kilos a meal until they're, they're until they're between four and five weeks calved. Um, I think certainly if, if we're allowing them to go up as far as 10 kilos earlier in lactation, I think we would we would run into problems, Jack. Yeah, yeah, um, I know. So it, I think I think sort of trying trying to restrict them for that first four weeks is, is important. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge, huge amount of feed. Um, Jack, I was just, just wondering, did, did Lyle and Stephen want to say anything maybe just about how that feed plan might, might or might not change for first lactation heifers? Uh, well, yeah, well, certainly for, for first lactation heifers, I mean, yes, the, and that's the, that, that's the beauty of having a computerized system here. We can, we can, we can do a lot of things very easily. Um, uh, and basically in, in this system, we can, we'll have a separate feed table for heifers, um, which, which, which runs along a similar the days are the same so event one event two event three all happen on the same day okay. um, but the difference is we're, we're building them up slower for the first three to four weeks so we're only we're building them up to six kilos after calving um instead of eight so we're building them up slower and then uh after that then we're we're, we're at a minimum of four and a half kilos instead of 5.4 and the heifers are only going as far as eight kilos instead of 10 even maximum so we're not we're not taking heifers up to 10 kilos um so again, that's again with a the flexibility there, and the maintenance figure because because we know the heifers are eating less TMR, we're only taking nineteen liters from the TMR instead of twenty three. Okay, so yeah, there is there is a difference there on the on the first lactation animals because the potential isn't there um, in terms of the yield etc as well. Like yeah, so no, so yeah. look, it, it gives us a feel and and in terms of what's happening and. Um, you've talked about some of the, the ingredients in the feed, so there's plenty of fiber, plenty of starches in there. Um, yeah. But of course, I mean, it's fair to say, Lyle, I mean, you, if, if the silage, if you had enough first cut silage, like the, the aim, if you had enough of first good quality first cut silage, you would be, right. you would be touching back the, the concentrate levels to, uh, to a certain extent. It, it, yeah, but uh, it definitely would be, definitely would be. Yeah. I mean, as I say, that's, if, if we're feeding 100% first cut silage, we would easily be back a kilo and a half to two kilos of concentrates per, per head per day. So we would, and, and you know, and that's, and as I say, that there has been previous winters where we've had first cut the whole way through, and, and we have had feed rates slightly lower. Um, uh, but uh, but no, that's that, that definitely the, the key thing is, is is making that good quality silage and, uh, and, and 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 making the most of it. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, it, the, 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 we, to, to, just to move it on, and we might come back to some of the issues again, but just to move it on in terms of, I, I suppose, checking that we're on the right line and that the Wallace farm is on the right line in terms of, I suppose, meeting the nutritional needs of the farm and, and meeting the, I suppose, the financial needs of the business. I mean, uh, margin over concentrate has been kind of the tool or the calculator that has been used for a, for a, for a long time up north in terms of try, trying to see is, is, is the amount of feed going in good enough for, for what the herd requires and financially that it makes sense because milk price and feed price and all these pieces come into play. Um, so just to, just to kick us off on this, earlier I had a chat with, with Alan Hopp, Senior Dairy Advisor with, with Deera to have a chat about, you know, I suppose, what is margin over concentrate? Why farmers should use it? And how many of Northern Ireland dairy farmers are using it at the moment? Right, folks, I'm delighted to be joined by Alan Hopp, Senior Dairy Advisor with DERA, to, to, I suppose, to ask him a couple of questions on margin over concentrate and what it means. We hear a lot about margin over concentrate. Alan, I suppose, first up, what is it? Why should farmers do it? And are there many farmers, Northern Ireland dairy farmers, using it as a benchmark? 
Yeah, I, I suppose margin over concentrate is, is very much what it says on the tin. It is just simply um, the milk value less the concentrate cost going into the herd. Uh, I suppose it's much more applicable to farmers in the north where our concentrate uh, costs are generally higher uh, than they would be in the south. Our concentrate bill on average here is around £600 a cow, so it is something just to keep a very close eye on that. And I would see it very much as an ongoing thing, uh, which is quite easy to do every month. Um, you have a few pieces of information to record, like your cow numbers, your milk value, milk litres, uh, concentrate tons and concentrate cost. And that will then give you a very quick um, margin over concentrate. And I think it gives you more... Um, I suppose information than a simple ratio or for example of as milk from forage on its own because it does take into account the volatility in prices which certainly we have seen over the past few years in the north here. Uh, I also think it tends to fill in the gaps maybe between uh, your sort of your annual benchmark or your annual e-profit monitor so it's given you uh, I suppose the dashboard as you go along and it's given you just how you perform uh, in between those two important uh, I suppose benchmarks if you like which are going right down to net profit um, and as I say uh, in the north well we have a number of farmers doing it there's always room for more uh, I suppose it's like mm -hmm. all of these things um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of farmers could still do it and uh, there are various different systems not alone with Caffrey uh, there are systems with the individual meal companies as well so there are different ways of doing it um, but as I say it is it is a matter of, of um, working out your own figure and I suppose one of the important things is then <clears throat> comparing that figure to other people it's not just a, a straight figure on its own it's, a, it's important to benchmark yourself against the others and see how you're doing okay I, he I hear you so as you say it, it's a measure it's not met net profit uh, but it can be used in association with that I suppose to kind of a, as, a, as a benchmark I mean I suppose Alan with a lot of these benchmarks you, you, you effectively you're kind of looking backwards to kind of see where you are and, and to see how you've done over over a period of time whether it's a year or a month or whatever i mean we're speaking here now i suppose in in early january i mean it you know december milk price effectively isn't set yet you know so some of the information is there or we can be very close i suppose on milk price and feed price and maybe milk yield i mean you, you touched off it in, in your answer there to the first question, but I mean, is, is there an exercise effectively that you need to carry out, kind of, I'll call it in advance, you know, or look forward into January and February to kind of see what actions you can take to change to, to address the kind of the margin over concentrate issue and, and how it compares relative to others? Yeah, well, I, I suppose we would see it as something that should be done routinely every month um, so that you, you see how, what your performance is and how you compare to others for that same month. Um, so you should now have your November figures completed with you know the uh, your your milk check having arrived in December there, and as I say, it's, it's just a matter of constantly checking. For example, are you getting the potential out of your silage uh, during the winter that you should be getting? So if your silage is analysed, uh, you, you know as M plus ten that you can get ten liters from it. Well, how much are you actually getting? Um, are you getting as much as you, you possibly can uh, from that silage? And uh, as I say, it's, it's a matter of then comparing yourself to others to see where you sit in a league table or where you sit in the quartile just to make sure that your, your performance is as, as good as it could be. And I suppose if it's not, well, then you start looking at wh where am I overfeeding? Am I getting the milk quality that I should be getting? Uh, is, is the potential being taken out of silage? Are there other underlying issues? You know, all of those types of things then can be asked at that point. And, and those are important questions to ask if you do see uh, that you're not, you're not up to par, I suppose, on your margin over concentrate. Alan, uh, relate margin over concentrate to net profit for me. I mean, does 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 higher margin over concentrate always mean higher profit, or 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 is there a benchmark figure per cow that we can use to kind of to get to net profit if we have margin over concentrate? Yeah, well, uh, certainly a good question, and I suppose in, in all of these things, uh, it's an organic system and there while you, you can make sweeping generalizations there's always a, a wide variation around those and i suppose in general yes higher margin over concentrate generally means higher profitability in other words margin over concentrate will explain more of your net profit than for example milk from forage will because you're taking into account milk price you're taking into account meal price and you're taking into account uh, feed efficiency uh, i suppose um Again, as I said, a sweeping generalization, if you take a thousand pounds off your margin over concentrate, it will get you roughly a net profit per cow. But again, that varies across all the different yield bands. The one notable exception I would say are those farms above 9,000 litres where they tend to have more costs than others. And 
that is an issue where those guys may have the highest margin over concentrate, but they don't generally have the highest net profit. Uh, you would have to drop down to the yield band of, say, eight to eight and a half thousand litres before you would find, um, I suppose, the highest profitability f for certainly systems in the north here. We would sort of tend to find that as a more of a, a sweet spot, if you like. You've got the milk, you've got efficiency, uh, and, and you're not pushing your cost too high. And generally speaking, those guys will be still making good use of forage. So, uh, as I say, that's the sort of findings that we have, we've seen so far just um, uh, on our margin over concentrate with Caffrey. Alan, obviously margin over concentrate has been a benchmark that's been around for a while, a, a tool to kind of see where you are. I mean, and obviously this year you will put another focus on it with your BDG groups and with your individual farmers to, to as you say, reinforce the message that, listen, this margin over concentrate is, is not in where it, where it needs to be. There, there should be something you can do. Absolutely. And as I say, it's, it's something we would be saying, you know, we encourage farmers to, to do that in between their benchmarks uh, to make sure they still do their benchmark to net profit uh, annually. But in between that, do your margin over concentrate to make sure your performance is as good as it can be. And I suppose with a view to improving your net profit for this current year. And as I say, if you do see problems, address them quickly um, and get your feed efficiency changed or wh whatever the problem is. Um, and certainly we, we see a lot of guys here who are on computerized feeding uh, and having set the computerized feeder, they think all my problems are solved. Well, at the end of the day, there can be a lot of issues before you actually get uh, your feed efficiency through margin over concentrate. So uh, we can identify problems through margin over concentrate, which can be uh, maybe mis miscalibration of feeders. Uh, maybe the computer system hasn't been programmed the way the farmer should have done it. Um, perhaps uh, cows are not grouped properly in the house with diet feeding systems. So there, there are a number of different issues which can be identified. So as I say, it's, it's good to look at that every month just to make sure uh, things are going as they should be. Alan, excellent. Leave it at that. Some good practical pointers there in terms of what to look out for if your margin over concentrate is not in place where it should be. Thanks, Alan. Talk again soon. Thank you, Jack. Aidan, I mean, we, we heard there from, from Alan, like, like obviously the margin over concentrate is, is just one tool, it's one benchmark, it's not the net profit figure that you, ideally you'd like to kind of see, I suppose, but I mean, it does give us a feel for where the business is going and where the, the feeding is going for these particular cows on, 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 on a farm, just like the Wallaces. Absolutely, Jack. Look, the information in one sense could be regarded as somewhat limited, but it is useful information and it can be collected on a regular basis, which is why we're encouraging and milk producers to participate in the margin over concentrate calculator. Basically, all you need to do is enter in your milk production uh, data and feed data on a monthly basis, along with cow numbers. You can get that from your milk statement and your, your, your mail invoices. Uh, and if you do that on a monthly basis, the program will generate a monthly and rolling average uh, results for each month. Okay. Some of you may already have, have had a look at this. It's on the DARA website through DARA online services. If you haven't and you have a government gateway account, you can access the program through selecting the CAFRI benchmarking option. Uh, and then you focus on the dairy margin over concentrate option, which you can see is highlighted by the black arrow. Okay, so look, I mean, it, it is what it is. As, as, I mean, I had the discussion with Alan that, listen, it's, it's not net profit, but, but, but it is margin over concentrate and it's, it's, one, it's one measure. And, and, and I suppose, it needs to be kind of done, I'll say, and it's fair to say it needs to be done fairly on time, you know, or else you're kind of looking yes. back three months in, in advance and you've, you're, the season is gone, the year is gone, you've not, you've, you know, you've, you've made your decisions and you can't do anything about it. You know, it need, you need to be on the ball kind of if you're going to use it as a tool. Absolutely, Jack. No, it's, it's something we're encouraging all the project farmers to do on a monthly basis. Once, once the milk check comes in and the mail invoices are in there, uh, we're encouraging them all to, to enter the data in at that stage because it gives us a feel for whether or not uh, performance is actually matching up with the targets that we set at the outset of the project. Uh, and you can see here, this this is what's been done for Stephen and Hazel. Uh, we looked at their latest production figures there for November 2020. And uh, for comparison's sake, we've put in the corresponding figures for November 2019. Uh, the figures we're concentrating on today would include the milk yield, the concentrate inputs, uh, the milk produced from forage and the corresponding feed rate and the margin over concentrate generated for those particular months. Uh, looking at those in a bit more detail, you can see uh, little or no difference really between milk yield between either month. But uh, in November 2020, significantly less concentrate has been required to produce that milk. And as a result, the milk produced from forage for November 2020 is just over three litres higher than what was 
period calculated in November 2019, and the feed rate has correspondingly gone down, and that in itself has improved the margin over concentrate. You can see in November 2020, uh, the margin over concentrate was six pounds 17 pence per cow per day, when in November 2019 it was five pounds 28. Now, it can be argued there are differences in milk price and meal price which will give, contribute to that. But when you repeat the exercise using just the, the meal input figures and the milk price figure for 2019 and apply those to the uh, figures in 2020, we still find that uh, improvements in feed efficiency have improved the margin over concentrate by approximately 40 pence uh, per cow per day. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that's important now. I mean, as you say, if you keep the November 2019 numbers the same in terms of milk price and feed price, um, and, and correspond them into November 2020, that, that there's still a benefit, isn't it? You know, absolutely, the, the absolutely yeah. yes. Okay. Um, okay, so that, I mean, that shows us, but that's that's just one month, I'll say. I mean, this this figure in terms of the annual performance is important as well, Aidan. Absolutely, and again, this is this is one of the advantages of participating in the margin over concentrate calculator. If you enter those figures in on a, on a monthly basis, uh, once you've got 12 months figures in, you can generate annual rolling figures as well. And, and this is what we've been able to do with Stephen and Hazel here. You can see uh, the rolling average figures up to the end of November 2020 and see how they compared with uh, the rolling average figures up to the end of November 2019. Uh, and again, we're looking at the figures there for milk yield, the concentrate inputs, the milk produced from forage, feed rate and margin over concentrate. Looking at those figures in a bit more detail, little or no difference there in annual milk yield per cow. You can see there the concentrate inputs though have crept up slightly. Uh, and as a result, the milk from forage has gone down slightly and the feed rate's gone up a bit. And the reasons for that have already been alluded to mm. to a certain degree. With, with, there was slightly higher feed rates at so, some points during last winter, but we also had that difficulty in that grass growth rates declined significantly in June uh, and the grass wasn't there to graze and we had to, we, we had to introduce feed to redress that balance. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's, it's, had a, it's had an impact on those figures to a certain degree. Um, but a margin over concentrate in both years there in around 1,400 pounds a cow, yeah. uh, which is approaching what the average figure would be on for farms across the margin over concentrate system. So, I mean, I mean, it's fair to say in looking at that, like, I mean, there's a big year effect in here in, in terms of, as you say, that was very dry in May or June. Like, I mean, May or June is a crucial time in terms of growing feed, growing grass on your farm. And if you get hit with a drought like the Wallace farm did, you know, it can have a big impact on the farm. So the fact that you're kind of close enough ballpark margin over concentrate, I mean, it's probably a good result, I'll say, in another kind of a way in terms of comparing one year with the next. Absolutely, Jack. And the fact that I think you've alluded to it yourself already, the fact that if you're doing it on a regular basis and you see at the end of the month what's going on, you can take action there and then rather than maybe look at this six, 12 months down the line and realize what happened and not be able to do anything about it at all. OK, um, I mean, this this kind of I suppose this 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 one of one of the kind of final slides, I mean, it, it brings us right up to speed, you know, in terms of here we are early January, just in terms of what actually what actually is happening on the farm. I mean, um, maybe you can just quickly take us through this and then maybe I'll go to Stephen and just talk about some of the some of the issues and I'll finish off with Lyle. So just take us through in terms of days in milk in terms of what's, what, uh, what's happening here at the moment. Okay, well, certainly, well, any, any of you that, that follow the DairyLink project on a regular basis will know that there's a, a weekly performance uh, table in, on the DairyLink page highlighting how each of the farms are doing. And these are the latest performance figures for Stephen and Hazel's farm. Uh, you can see on average, cows are around 110 days in milk. Um, Lyle already mentioned uh, average milk yield of around 34 litres a day with a corresponding solid yield of 2.6 kilos per cow. And that's currently being achieved of 12.4 kilograms of concentrate per cow per day. And the corresponding milk produced from forage figure there is 6.4 litres per cow, uh, which is actually slightly above what uh, we were encountering in, in November. Feed rate there, when you, uh, you look at it, uh, currently around 0.36 kilos per litre. And the margin over concentrate, if we assume a milk price of 30 pence a litre and a concentrate price of 250 pounds a tonne, equates to a figure of seven pounds 10 per cow per day. Okay, so I mean, as you say, I mean, these, these numbers bring it right up. This is exactly what's happening at the moment. I mean, Stephen, is there, is there a, has anything changed in terms of, you know, like, I mean, there's issues around feeding, we'll say, like, checking that the parlour feeders are working correctly creating more feed space for the cows so that they can access more feed. I mean, any of those real practical stuff, has, and has any of that changed on your farm, we'll say, in the last kind of year or so, you know, in terms of trying to trying to improve? Because they're the, they're, that's the nuts and bolts, I suppose, about trying to kind of, you know, get more from feed. 
not within the last year, Jack, but one thing I would like to highlight there, that slide shows the cows. Um, a thing that we did do, which was a great benefit to us without a great cost, that used to be where they were feed, stand feeding there was a solid wall. And that takes them out into a, a feed area that previously they had to walk outside to get to this feed area and uh, remove that wall and widen the feed truck. I think some of the other slides will show maybe you have the, the dad feeder running down and it'll, it'll show it better. Yeah. Um, we took that out and give that gives them feed space from either side of the wall, which we've found has been uh, beneficial. Um, probably run about two and a quarter feet per cow. It's maybe not uh, uh, feed space per cow at the moment there. Okay. Once we, the rest of the dry cows um, calve down, that will add us another uh quarter overall will last add, us, add another quarter of uh, a foot okay so that, i mean that like i mean feed space is crucial in terms of you know especially when you have a mixture of lactation numbers you know you've heifers milking you know milking with with mature cows etc i mean feed space is crucial especially at, at you know when you're producing milk in do indoors you know from from silage it's absolutely crucial. so you, that has been a real positive steve when you think in terms of increasing that like yeah definitely definitely yeah and with it, without a lot of cost. Just sometimes you can look around your farm and uh, you can't always see for your, you know, uh, think outside the box. It was just a matter of taking a wall, which uh, made, made, made a, a low cost, significant change. Um, Lyle, I suppose, if, again, to, to stand back maybe from Stephen's farm in terms of, uh, you know, um, I suppose issues that are happening, you know, for feed companies in terms of sourcing feeds. I mean, we've, we, obviously Brexit has been sorted or at the start of the solution has been, <laughs> has, has been sorted uh, just before Christmas. But I mean, in terms of, you know, fee, access to types of feed or, I mean, again, South America, we see Argentina putting up its borders in terms of not letting feed out of Argentina because they want to keep it in the country, et cetera, and that kind of thing. Is there any issues that you see on the horizon that will kind of impact on feed availability or feed prices or, or you know, that, that yeah, you know, that farmers, including the likes of Stephen, need to be kind of conscious of in the kind of coming weeks and months? Yeah, well, well, well certainly, I mean, obviously, I mean, currently, as you, you mentioned, the Argentinian problem um, at the minute, I mean, uh, to be honest, I was formulating, I was changing, formulating a lot of rations there this morning, just um, uh, to, to actually reduce the level of soil holes being used in rations, reduce the level of soya being used in rations. Um, I mean, that, that, that's having a major impact. Probably, it'll be hopefully short term, maybe for the next sort of four to six weeks. Um, and I was hearing prices of soya being quoted at, at 500 pounds a ton today, whereas three months ago, soya was 300 pounds a ton. Um, so that, that's obviously having a major impact, and that's if you can get it. Um, so those two products are going to have major, are going to cause major issues um, in terms of availability and price then as well. And, um, and so, what's been replaced instead of those soya hulls or soya products? What, what, what are you yep. using instead? Well, well, basically, I suppose that currently what we're using instead is we're, 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 we're using extra sugar beet nuts, um, so which are available. There's plenty available, um, but obviously it, it's adding a cost. Um, because they're traditionally and, and currently in around sort of 30 to 40 pounds a ton deer than, than soya hulls. Um, we're, we're using more rapeseed meal, maize distillers, products um, to, to, to lift the protein levels uh, whenever we're using less soya. Um, in, in Stephen's particular farm, and in a fair a lot of farms, uh, certainly I've been dealing with, we're, we're keeping crude protein levels quite low in the diet anyway. Um, so the, the, the soya impact won't be huge with us. Um, and especially because Stephen is quite high, high protein silage, even though his third cut's a great example. His third cut silage is low energy, but it's 20% protein. So, I mean, Stephen's parlor nut 17% is blend, the dairy blend in the wagon's 18%. Whenever we get into grazing, the grazing season, the crude protein level of the nuts will be brought right back down to 13 or 14 percent protein. So mm. we're not heavily reliant on protein in, in Stephen's yard, which is which is a good thing um, from our point of view. But certainly moving forward, who knows, I suppose, Jack, um, to be honest, I mean, there's a lot of chat about soya products in general, mm. maybe maybe the carbon footprint, etc. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some supermarkets have already banned them. Um, so if you're producing milk, maybe for a, for a major supermarket in, in, in England, for example, you, you mightn't be allowed to use soya anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so so th those types of products, palm oil products as well, potentially mm -hmm. in the future, um, those sort of things are, are potentially going to maybe disappear from the market. 
um, and, and we need to be looking at options now for, for that happening maybe in the future. Mm. Um, but in terms of silage quality, listen, if you can keep energy levels up and protein levels up in silage, it, it reduces your reliance on those things an awful lot anyway. Okay. And, and, and like, just in terms of the breaks at one perfect, I mean, in specifically, I mean, there's, there's nothing there. You, you, you can't, you look at the, who knows, as you, as you say, yeah. but you can't see anything happening. Just that quick, we'll say that, that the availability of feeds of byproducts or anything like that can, will be impacted, we'll say on, on no, I, I, I can't see, certainly in the short term, no, I can't see anything happening, happening any, any time soon, um, in terms of availability, et cetera. And, and obviously the, well, the currency, how Brexit affects currency moving forward will again affect the price, but, um, we just we just have to wait. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, folks. I mean, I look at. I think we've had a we've had a we've had a great chat about kind of I suppose what's happening on the Wallace Farm, and I suppose in general what's happening in terms of father father, father and silage quality, we'll say out there, and the impact that that's having on in terms of feed rates, etc., on farms. But I mean, I think we look at. I, I if I kind of summarize very quickly, I think in terms of what is what we've discussed. I mean, I think we started at the outset talking about Stephen and he's heard and it's, that the fact that it's in transition we're not he's he's by no means putting his hand up and saying this is this is the best i can do it's it's a herd in transition he's trying to compact the calving a little bit more he's putting a bit a bit more effort into the kind of sire selection and i suppose fertility management by by farming out that piece of work to to rms in terms of making that happen uh, getting the fertility management correct so i mean there, there's changes happening on the on the wallace farm um that, that, that Stephen and hazel are doing now to try and improve their situation so in effect that's great another one we mentioned of course was the grass measurement and, and keeping a handle on that during the grazing season um, because that that drives the feed produced produced on the farm and the feed that goes down the throat of the cow um at the during the grazing year and i mean aiden talked just through the fodder audit piece that carried out in june or july to make sure that that we had enough feed on the farm for the winter and then the changes that happened then you know the more per, more more feed was purchased to, to to fill the gap you know and again then uh, lyle took us through the quality of the so testing the silages to make sure that there was the quality was there and then trying to trying to maximize the use of that quality of the first cut is kind of diluted There's a bit more feed going in but i mean that's what you have to do if you don't have the forage quality in in play when you're when you're feeding cows indoors producing milk you know so that's 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 part of it so developing that whole winter feeding plan and and that whole parlor uh, performance and we we finished up with a chat with alan hops and again aiden on i suppose the margin over concentrate as a tool as a benchmark to try and um, I suppose, yeah, see what see what's happening on the farm and seeing what changes can be made now when the when the when it's active when the farm is is spending a lot of money on feed and producing a lot of milk um, indoors. Um, obviously, as Stephen said at the very start, he's lucky that he has a dry farm and that he can get out as as soon as kind of I suppose weather conditions are good and there's a grass supply around the farm. And again, that's part of the budgeting and measurement that that's that he's doing and that they're doing on the on the Wallace farm. So that in effect is, is it's, it's a big difference, obviously, to what's happening over in, in OMAC, where, where, where ground conditions will impact a, a lot a lot more, you know, in that early part of the season. So that's that's a benefit that the Wallace farm has in Seaford County Down. Um, so listen, I mean, I, I think I think there's not much more to say other than to thank um, Lyle, Stephen and Aidan and indeed Alan Hops for, for their participation in this webinar. Peter McCann, our own Peter McCann, will be obviously following this and a lot more that's happening on the Dairy Link Farms through the through the pages in the Farmers Journal and in through videos and through uh, podcasts, etc. that happen as a result of that program. So, I mean, for anyone else that's interested in that, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a platform there every, every week and every day to, to try and, um, to try and get a bit more on, on what to kind of find out a bit more that's happening uh, on these farms. So with that, it's, um, I suppose it's, it's, it's look after yourself during these COVID times and look after your fam family members and your farm staff to make sure that you can get through uh, the COVID period that we have. But again, to think of the practical stuff that's happening in terms of feed management on your farm and some of the changes that you can make. Thanks to Stephen, Aidan and Lyle. Thank you. Thank you.